Another redistricting deadline has come and gone without a new set of maps. What this means for the future of the May primary. President Biden made a quick stop to the Buckeye State this week. What he had to say about a $1 billion investment in the Great Lakes. And did stimulus checks equal more opioid deaths? We take a closer look at a study by the Ohio AG's office linking those two situations. Thank you so much for joining us for Face the State this morning. I'm Tracy Townsend. The redistricting fight continues with lawmakers unable to reach an agreement. They missed yet another important deadline this week. This is the state's third attempt at creating new voting maps. The Ohio Supreme Court previously rejected two different sets of legislative maps because of partisan gerrymandering. Now there are talks of the state having two primaries. A spokesperson for the Franklin County Board of Elections says that could put voters and candidates in a tough spot. The back and forth between the commission and the Supreme Court, uh, you know, I think they're in round three. Um, you know, it can't go on forever. Uh, we, we don't know when the end date is, but uh, it just it, it can't it can't go on forever. So, you know, we are certainly very hopeful uh, that they can get this thing buttoned up and um, you know, approved, uh, you know, as soon as possible uh, so that we could potentially, uh, you know, have a primary, one primary in, you know, June, July, or potentially August. Um, you know, it takes about four weeks to, uh, to get the ballot ready we will keep checking in with the Franklin County Board of Elections on the status of the main primary. And of course, we will let you know if any dates change. President Joe Biden stopped in Lorraine this week. He touted major infrastructure funding. We're announcing an investment of $1 billion. $1 billion. <laughs> from the bipartisan infrastructure bill. The funding will be used to clean and restore environmentally degraded sites around the Great Lakes, which is a major source of drinking water in the region. The funding bolsters an effort known as the Great Lakes Restoration Initiative that was launched back in 2010. This week's trip was the latest by the president to highlight the benefits of his $1.2 trillion infrastructure law. We're declaring gun violence a public health crisis. We will not wait for others to act. Columbus Mayor Andrew Ginther announced a new plan to fight back against gun violence. City leaders announced the formation of the Columbus Alliance Against Illegal Guns. Their mission is to demand what the mayor describes as common sense gun reform from the State House and Congress. The group will also form new initiatives to prevent gun violence like the group violence intervention that will launch in March. The alliance is made up of people in the community, faith leaders, city leaders, and medical professionals, along with Representative Dontavious Geralds. To hear the stories of families who simply want action, who may not be able to embrace their loved one again, but they are using their voice to ensure that someone else can. That's the multi-system approach we need to truly solve gun violence in this state and in this city. And I stand with our, our pastors, our city council, our Senate with Senator Herschel Craig, the mayor's office, and every agency and entity and organization in between to ensure that we are building an Ohio that truly is saving lives. The Ohio House passed a bill that would allow police officers injured during a riot to be able to sue people or organizations that provided help to the rioters. Help could be things like providing lodging or transportation. That legislation also increases penalties for rioting and creates new charges for it. 
The American Civil Li Liberties Union calls the bill an extreme attack on free speech. The bill now heads to the Senate. When a child commits a crime, what goes into the decision of whether they are punished as a juvenile or an adult? An Ohio lawmaker is asking to rethink how we punish our state's youth by rethinking what's known as bind-over laws. As 10TV's Kevin Landers explains, one family believes if judges had more discretion, it may have saved their loved one's life. The woman that's about to enter your screen is going to show you a picture. This is his obituary. That's her brother, Matthew. He was convicted at 16 years old of aggravated robbery. They sentenced him to the four years. And when he turned 18, they have a bind over law in place for, um, for juveniles who commit felons. Natalie Aleem says when her brother went to prison, his life changed for the worse. He was fighting a lot from in juvenile. He wasn't getting into as much trouble as he was when he went to prison there. He had to basically fight for his life. That's where he joined a gang for protection because there they just take advantage of young men. In Ohio, judges don't have the discretion to determine if a child should remain in juvenile detention or prison. It's what's called mandatory bind overs. This lawmaker wants to change that. If that judge determines that a child is better served in the juvenile system, our bill simply gives them the discretion to put them there. Representative Stewart says on a recent tour of Orient Prison, he was stunned at how many children were inside. He says it's time Ohio changes how judges determine which children are better suited for adult prison. As of today, we have a one size fits all policy for the state, which takes away judges discretion. Representative Stewart says his research found that children sent to adult prison are 34% more likely to reoffend, are five times more likely to be sexually assaulted, and because children are isolated in adult prison, they are 36 times more likely to die by suicide. I think when we're faced with statistics of that kind, uh, we have to look and say we can do better as a state. In the case of Natalie's brother, he did his time, left prison, and started working. Less than two years after his release, she said, he was murdered. Shot to death, she says, by gang members he met in prison who he no longer wanted to have contact with. And he didn't want that lifestyle. She believes if Ohio changed its juvenile bind-over law, it could have saved her brother's life. I think he would still be here right now. Kevin Landers, 10TV News. We're told this bill does have bipartisan support. The former Ohio Department of Job and Family Services director has stepped down from her new post in North Carolina. Kimberly Henderson was just named the head of racial equity initiatives for the mayor of Charlotte. But after two weeks on the job, she's out following a report about the audit that identified $3.8 billion worth of unemployment fraud and overpayments during the pandemic. Henderson released a statement on her resignation. It reads in part, quote, the work of the initiative is too critical to be jeopardized in any way by public misperceptions related to my prior leadership as a cabinet director for Ohio Governor Mike DeWine. Henderson has not been criminally charged for the fraud and overpayments. She stepped down from ODJFS last March. The Ohio AG's office is releasing the results of a new study. It showed a possible link between federal stimulus checks and a record increase in opioid deaths. 10TV's Brittany Bailey looked into the study and talked with Dave Yost. The study set out to answer this question. Did federal stimulus payments lead to more people dying of drug overdoses? It is a peer-reviewed study set to be published this April. We asked Dave Yost about what prompted the study and what he thought about the results. So you think there was a causal connection in this study? The study found that there was a causal connection between the stimulus checks in 2020 and the uh, overdose death spike that we saw uh, that spring as well. And the Now, it wasn't the only thing. Uh, the paper notes that it was kind of a perfect storm. You have 
social isol isolation and the lockdown and you know the mental health issues that were surrounding um, the fear of the pandemic. And he's right. The study did show there was a significant increase in the number of opioid overdose deaths during the same time the stimulus payments went out in 2020. But the conclusion of the study notes the identified change point may refer to the timing of many factors, not only the economic payments and further research is warranted to investigate the potential relationship between the COVID-19 economic impact payments and overdose deaths. So the bottom line here is this study did find that the timing of the stimulus payments did overlap with an increase in opioid deaths. The authors, though, say the results warrant further investigation into the potential link between the payments and those overdose deaths. Brittany Bailey, 10TV News. And we should be clear here that Dave Yost did point to other factors that contributed to this. And he says he feels the study should be used to inform public officials in the future when deciding how and when to offer payments. We have a warning for parents. Chances are if your kids need mental health help, you won't be able to get it. We're going to walk you through the reason for that struggle. The National Suicide Hotline number will change this year. An Ohio lawmaker behind the bill explains how. Any mental health uh, a crisis that someone might be going through uh, will be uh, channeled, uh, you know, when they call 988, will be part of a, uh, of a system where they will be able to get the help that they need and be able to talk to someone immediately. Right now, the National Suicide Prevention Hotline is 1-800-273-8255. It will not change to 988 until July. Children's mental health professionals across Ohio and the country say the profession is at a breaking point. Over the past three years, Ohio has dedicated $1.2 billion for student wellness. The number of children seeking help for depression, anxiety, suicide is overwhelming the system. Reporter Kevin Landers looks at why parents are struggling to find help. She's very loving and outgoing. This is a story about an adopted girl from Russia. <laughs> her mother, Lisa Danino, says at the age of three, she noticed her daughter needed help. Danino took this video as her daughter became uncontrollable. She's sharing it because this is what a lot of parents and children are dealing with. And then around three, she started displaying really unique behaviors that were not typical. They weren't the terrible twos or anything that any other mom I spoke to was familiar with. Danino says she desperately tried to find help for her daughter. Nobody wanted to work with a toddler and insurance wasn't going to cover it anyway. And nobody believed me until they saw the video. She says it took three years on a waiting list to find a therapist to work with her daughter. The waiting, she says, just made her child worse. It gets progressively worse because as she's supposed to be maturing and fitting into societal norms, that child is not doing that. So there's more and more disappointments every day. Kristen Centel runs one of the few child therapy offices in the city. So even if you were to double your staff, could you still meet the demand? No, we could not meet the demand if we tripled our staff right now. 76% of the counties in Ohio are what's called mental health HPSAs, or health professional shortage areas. These are areas seen in red where there is a shortage of health professionals. It's truly at a breaking point in terms of the sheer numbers of people who cannot get access to care. Jared Skillings is with the American Psychological Association. The wait lists for mental health conditions across the whole country are absolutely out of control. Danino agrees. She says it wasn't until she had to call police because she couldn't control her daughter that she says she was able to move up the waiting list at Nationwide Children's Hospital. So what does that tell you? I mean, was my child honestly going to almost have a police record before any therapist would talk to her? <laughs> That's insane. Prior to the opening of Nationwide Children's Hospital Big Lots Behavioral Health Pavilion, it had 28 beds. Since then, it's gone from 44 to 56 beds. And the hospital says it could add more. So why isn't it? The director says he doesn't have enough workers. 
If we had more staff, we would open more beds. Dr. David Axelson is the chief of the Department of Psychiatry and medical director of the Big Lots Behavioral Health Pavilion at Nationwide Children's Hospital. So some of our programs, you know, the waits are several months, some of them not as long. Even children who express suicidal thoughts must wait. So some of these prioritized kids will get in within three or four days. The hospital says patients who express emergency suicidal ideation have immediate resources available to them, including the Franklin County Youth Crisis Line, which is available around the clock. Dr. Axelson says since the pandemic, more kids are hurting. Depression and anxiety, at least, has increased significantly in our kids. But without more people to care for them, he says he's worried about what will happen. He says Ohio lacks child psychiatrists. Yeah, we're probably about four times lower than what we truly need. We move this guy over here. Inside this private practice in Columbus, which specializes in child therapy, therapists say wait times are longer than they've ever been. If someone were to email me today, it would probably be about a year before I could see their kid. Before the pandemic, they say wait times were a few months. We get requests for services seven to ten times a day for new clients that we just can't support. Turning parents away, they say, has always been an issue. Now it happens more often because of the demand. What is it like for you to tell a parent no? Heartbreaking. Danielle Weatherholt is one of the few people in Columbus that works with children as young as three years old. Like many professionals, she thought Children's Hospital Behavioral Center would help absorb more kids in need. So it didn't provide the relief that you had hoped it would provide? No, no, and not for families either. And I hear that from families all the time. But they just have this new building. We just heard they increased all these services. I called them and it said, you know, six months to a year. As for Lisa Danino, she says she feels lucky she found a therapist that's helping her daughter. She just wishes there were more of them. Basically, they are saints on earth. <laughs> we just don't have that many saints. That was 10 TV's Kevin Landers reporting. The problem doesn't stop there. Those who work in child therapy say insurance companies like Medicare haven't raised their reimbursement levels to keep up with inflation. So some therapists are no longer accepting insurance, so parents now have to pay out of pocket. If you think your child needs help, here are some red flags, a change in interest or isolating themselves, a change in sleep or appetite, a sudden change in friends, or feeling a sense of hopelessness or thoughts of suicide. Nationwide Children's Hospital also has a list of podcasts to help teach parents how to deal with this difficult topic. And we have a link to those and many more at our website, and that's 10tv.com. There's a push to make distracted driving a primary offense in Ohio. And this comes as the Maria Tiberi Foundation announces a new initiative to teach young drivers the importance of paying attention. Dom is going to have that announcement after the break. One Ohio lawmaker is trying to steer the state in a different direction. State Senator Michael Rooley announced his bill to make Ohio the next leader in electric vehicle manufacturing. The senator says this isn't just for consumers. We want to encourage growth in Ohio EVs with incentives, not only for regular consumers, but for people that are buying fleet vehicles. We want to capture the fleet market, whether it's just if you're UPS and you want to redo your, your vehicles or whether maybe it's something like First Energy. No word just yet on how fast the Ohio lawmakers will move to get that piece of legislation through. We'll keep you posted. Right now, Ohio lawmakers are also talking about a bill to make distracted driving a primary offense under House Bill 283. Holding a cell phone while driving would be illegal. This comes as 10 TV's Dom Tiberi makes a special announcement to help raise awareness about distracted driving. Hi guys and welcome to the Maria Tiberi Foundation Simulator Lab here at the Tolls Career and Technical Center. It's the first of its kind in the United States and you know we love this because all the kids here that go to Tolls will be required to take it. It's a 16 different lesson plans on here. Takes them about six and a half hours to go through it. And uh, it's gonna make them better drivers. We know it. Todd Hoadley is the superintendent. And Todd, I don't have to tell you, it's the leading killer car crashes are of kids age eight to 24. And what we're doing here is we're trying to save lives. 
Absolutely, and not just the lives of our students here, uh, but also impairing or preventing the impact on their families. There's nothing worse, uh, Dom, as you know, just the experience of losing a loved one. And as you mentioned, uh, uh, these students are in that age bracket where uh, death by car accident is a leading cause. And so we wanna do anything that we can to prevent those things from happening. Well, we appreciate everything you've done. Let's come over here. Some of these students here, this young lady said she would talk to us. Tell everyone your name. My name is Jocelyn Krantz. What do you think of this? What are you learning? It's six and a half hours. You're going to have to do it to, to graduate from here. I think it's a really good experience to learn how to drive ahead. If you haven't got your drive-ins, it's good for practice, and it teaches you everything you need to know as well. You know, we're all about uh, saving lives, and, you know, moms and dads, they worry about You do understand your parents worry sick about you behind the wheel, right? Yes, I do. Well... Yeah. Appreciate everything you're doing. You keep going. Now, we do have exciting news, and I wish we had a drum roll. This is the first of its kind in the United States, this school here, and we can't thank Tolls enough for being the first, but we're going to duplicate this, and within the next few months, we're going to be opening a new one. It's going to be located at the Eastland Career Center in Groveport, and we are just pumped as heck that we're going to be able to do this. And, you know, this is not a job. This is a labor of love. It is a mission for my wife, Terry, and I. As I said, as parents and grandparents, we should be screaming from the mountaintop that the leading killer of our kids is car crashes. We can't wait till this COVID is out of here because we're going to open this up here. We're going to open it up at Eastland. And uh, once again, the big announcement, we're going to duplicate this. We're going to put a new one in at the Eastland Career Center in Groveport. We'll have two of them, first of their kind, and we want to keep going from there. All right, and you can learn more about Dom's mission to teach young drivers. Go to 10tv.com slash Maria's message. Cardiovascular disease is the number one killer of women and does not take into account whether they vote Democratic or Republican. The message for women, no matter how they vote, is to listen to your body. The American Heart Association held its annual Columbus Go Red for Women luncheon late last week. This year's co-chairs, Ola Snow from Cardinal Health and 3rd District Congresswoman Joyce Beatty, who is a stroke survivor. Her message is that while so many women are in isolation, they're working from home or maybe in a hybrid situation, she says it's key for women to check on one another and to take your own health very seriously. And I can't stress enough for people to listen to their body. We all know when we've had that extra cup of coffee because we were tired, or we all know when we'll say, just, just one more thing, just one more task to get done. Then I'm going to say to you, when you get to that point, Say, let me set aside that task for now and do it hours later or the next day. It is so critical that we pay attention to what our body is telling us. Eat right, rest, have fun and enjoy yourself. But most importantly, know that it's up to us to take care of us. And you can get started on this journey or get inspired with some new ideas at the American Heart Association's website, whether you're looking to mellow out or reduce stress or to get up and move to the groove at www.heart.org. Finally this week on Face of the State in celebration of presidents, it's more than a day of great shopping. The nation will recognize President's Day tomorrow on Monday, February 21st. It's a federal holiday celebrating George Washington's birthday and honoring all of the United States presidents who served in office. Our state, Ohio, is sometimes referred to as the mother of presidents, according to the State House Museum Education Center. Seven U.S. presidents were born in Ohio. They are Ulysses S. Grant, Rutherford Hayes, James Abram Garfield, Benjamin Harrison, William McKinley, William Howard Taft, Warren Harding. There's also William Henry Harrison, who was born in Virginia, but then settled in Ohio and claimed Ohio as president. Now, we thank you for being here, and we hope you will learn more about the presidents who claim our state as their own. Have a great week. <laughs>